pray for the Bruno family. We pray for James as he's in his last moments, Lord. I pray that you would comfort him. Thank you that uh, he uh, has uh, professed to believe in you, and Lord, there's hope in that, and um, we thank you for that, Lord, and pray that you would be with him in the last moments, comfort him, be with the family, be with the kids. May they seek you through this, Lord, and draw closer to you, and um, I pray that you would just wrap your loving arms around that family in a special, special way in this time, and that you would be with them, Lord. Pray for the other physical needs connected, the ones we've mentioned in the past, and well, with ongoing physical needs, I pray that you would touch these lives, Lord. I pray that you would uh, help Jacob as he was in this car accident and isn't able to work. I pray that you would uh, help him to recover to where he can get back to work and help them um, with missing work and financially and different things like that, Lord, and pray that you would help them in that situation. I pray that you would be with the Kids Connection kids and Heather as she teaches them. May they just... Um, Come to know you, Lord, and to learn about you all they can and to have a love for you at a young age. And, uh, Lord, I pray for each one of those kids where they are and for the kids' connection that's going to happen tonight. Lord, uh, I pray for each one that came through our trunk retreat last night, and you know where they live, who they are, you know their hearts. And I pray, Lord, that um, you would take what we, what we gave last night and just uh, use it as a spark for them and work on their hearts and um, God, whether they ever come to this church again or not, uh, if um, you, you can save souls through it and you can use us, and um, God, I pray that you would touch each one of those lives that came through our trunk retreat. Thank you for your help. Thank you for all who helped have a part of that, Lord. And I, uh, I pray for each one here. I pray for us and our families, and uh, I pray that you would just um, guide us and um, that we would be able to serve you and um, trust in you more and more, Lord. Thank you for all your many, many blessings, and uh, Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, Pastor Aaron is coming, what? He just sat down. Pastor Aaron is coming to preach, ready or not, here he comes. <laughs> all right, is that on? If I go like that, okay, yes. All right, well, good morning. Thank you for being here today. There's probably more truth to the ready or not than Pastor Eric realized. It, it's, um, you know, we've been praying for the Bruno family, and obviously, um, that's that's my son's father-in-law, and he's in the hospital just right down here. Uh, we've had their kids, and it's been just kind of um, felt like an out of control week. <laughs> so, but but as as Eric said, uh, he has professed to be right with God, and um, that's a comfort. All right, we're going to be looking to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. And uh, it's, it, Pastor Eric mentioned yesterday, I think. And it's something we've heard. Maybe, maybe Dr. Avery said something about it too. Um, about preachers who stand up and say, for the sake of time, we won't read the whole passage. And... <laughs> So in that spirit, I'm going to read the whole chapter, all right? (laughs) 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to begin reading with verse 1. There's there's so much in this chapter, but I won't try to preach it all today, so don't don't worry. Verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven, if so, being, uh, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. Interestingly enough, just I, I looked at that in the um, my Amplified, and it, it's simply saying that we aren't found without a body. So our mortal body is going to die, but we're going to receive a glorified body. Um, Verse 4, 
For we that are in this tabernacle, that's, that's this mortal body, do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but be clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought for us the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. And I'm going to stop and, and talk about that verse for just a second, because that could be taken out of context. And it could sound like that we work to be saved, and we understand that we're saved through grace by faith. This labor is something entirely different. And, and let me read to you uh, from the Amplified, because it gives it a better perspective, I think. Therefore, whether we are at home on earth or away from home and with Him, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing to Him. That's a result of what God does for us. Okay, So we don't work to be saved, but because we're saved, we're given to good works. Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Here, here's a strong uh, part of this passage. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Listen. Some people get carried away when they think about grace. I guess, if you could be. In other words, they act like God is their buddy. Listen. Saved. Cleansed from sin. Sanctified. Ready to meet God. When we stand before Him, we're going to realize the terror of the Lord. Right with Him. He's still beyond His greatness, His brightness, His glory is beyond what we can imagine. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That, that's simply saying that without God, we're walking dead men. And that he died for all, verse 15, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray together for a moment. Our Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come right now. And Lord, we trust you through your Holy Spirit to do the miraculous, that you take the words that I'm speaking and let them be guided by you, and that you Take the ears who are hearing in this building right now and guide the words that need to be guided by your Holy Spirit to our hearts to be applied in the way that you know that we need them. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so 
For a, pa- or for a text, I want to use verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But within this passage that we read, we see God at work through the Trinity. And this is where I stopped a few minutes ago. In the Trinity, we see modeled God in relationship together. That's who He is, and we're made in His image. And that's why this kind of fellowship is so important for us. Because God made us to be people who are part of relationships. We're relational. That's in His image. But as we look, and and by the way, I read to you in verse 5, and in the first few verses of this chapter, we see the Trinity. Verse 5, Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. And into the next verse, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And the Lord in this context is talking about Jesus Christ, um, who we find in in verse 10. And then on down um, in verse 19, once again we see that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to, to, to himself. So the Trinity, the three in one, is doing the work of God as the triune Godhead. I, I have a whole sermon that I preach on this, on the Trinity, and I can't preach the whole thing this morning, okay? So if I create more questions in your mind than, than I answer... Um, text me, call me, or I'll do my best to, to, to open it up for you even more. But in the Trinity, and, and I've talked about it recently, I know that I have, but we see God the Father, who in, in a perfect reflection of Himself is God the Son, and between God the Son and God the Father, because this perfect reflection of God the Father must be personal and alive and real, there's a divine communication from whence springs the divine Holy Spirit. And so within one, there are three persons. Within Scripture, we find God the Father to be the lawgiver. But from God the Father also springs love and mercy and grace, which is manifest in God the Son, Jesus Christ. God the Holy Spirit is God's communicator with us. And Jesus said, it is expedient that I go away. He told his disciples this in, John, in the book of John. He said it. It's necessary that I go away so that the Comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, will come. Because the Comforter is the Spirit of God that can communicate with every one of us within our spirit that he made. As I mentioned, we are designed relationally, but we, we are designed first to be in a relationship with the one who made us, our creator, our maker. But that's broken. And, and I, I led one group last night through Trunk or Treat, and I, I don't know how long it took me, but it took me a while, and everybody was saying, oh, he's preaching. But, but the thing is, that the, the message is there, and it begins with, our relationship, man's relationship with God being broken by sin in the garden. And we're all sinners. And that sin builds a wall that, that keeps us from having a relationship. God wants to have a relationship with man. Man was made to have a relationship with God. But it, it's been a while since I preached this message. But some of you will remember I actually made boxes that looked like bricks and built a wall. That wall is sin. And it keeps us from being in relationship with God. And, and our, when I say that we're meant to be in relationship with God, what I mean is when we're separated from God by sin, we're not what we should be. It skews the personality. It, it ruins every other relationship. 
We're not what we should be, and we don't even know it. That's why the apostle wrote, and I, I stopped and I said it, we're walking dead men without him. We're dead in trespasses and sin. But what we read also is that there is a reconciliation. And verse 19 tells us that it's through Jesus and His sacrifice, His blood, that we can be reconciled to God. How does that happen? Jesus' blood. Some people will tell you that Jesus' blood is a covering for our sins. But Scripture goes beyond that. Scripture says that Jesus' blood cleanses us. It wipes out our sins. It sweeps it away. So that whereas we were completely guilty, if you could, if you could just make a simple illustration, because we talk about our hearts. So I understand, and I know that you understand, that our actual physical heart is just an organ. And, and yet we talk about giving our hearts to Jesus and God being in our hearts. We're talking about the center of our emotions. And different societies express that in different ways, but ours is our heart, right? And, and um, in, in Bible times, they talked about their bowels. That would be their center. Um, I read a story about a woman who went to um, a section of New Guinea where the, their language had never been broken down and written. So there was a tribe there, and they, they had a spoken language, but it, it, it had never been translated into written um, words. And so this, this woman went there, and, and she was a Bible translator, and she went and she was trying to understand the language, put it into writing, and then translate. And, and their translation was, it, it, we talk about our hearts, um, Bible times they talked about their bowels, and these people talked about their liver. I, I don't know why, but anyhow. <laughs> we talk about our heart being dark and black, and Jesus' blood coming in and cleansing us, so that what, what the Bible says is that our sins, though they were scarlet, are, are, will be white as snow. We're completely cleansed. It's not just a covering. I, I looked for a story as I studied, not a story, but a part of John Wesley's journal, and, and I didn't find it easily enough, but I, so I'm going to try to give it to you anyhow. Uh, but John Wesley was talking about Jesus' blood cleansing us. And, and Jesus' blood is, is forgiveness for us. Do you understand that? That's, that's where we, we come to God and we're completely lost and we're completely um, without any plea. We can't say, God, I deserve this because we're sinners. And yet, because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can come to God and, and ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness. And our past sins are gone. But God doesn't want to stop there. He wants, us to, he wants to make us into what He always intended for mankind to be. Um, and that's... There, there's a morality that we know intrinsically. It's a morality um, that was before the law. Righteousness. God wants us to live right. Okay? But that takes a continual work. A work that doesn't just happen once. But it takes a continual work. And so what John Wesley was saying was, he was talking about the grass along the road. Now, obviously, he's living in the 1700s. There are no real paved roads. They're dirt. There's no cars. There's people walking, stirring up dust. There's horses 
walking, stirring up dust. There might be horses galloping if they're in a hurry. There's carriages being pulled by horses. You have steel wheels being turned. Horses, there's, there's dirt everywhere. And the grass, the beautiful green grass by the road turns into just a dirty mess. And he says, but in the midst of this, there's a spring by the road. And the water, the, the cool, clear, clean water bubbling up, as it bubbles up and the water runs to the nearest low spot, it cleanses the grass. And so you see beautiful green grass that is always clean. That's what I'm talking about. It doesn't just cleanse us once, but it keeps us clean constantly. But what we're here to talk about today, and I better hurry, <clears throat> the change that this reconciliation brings, it makes a new creature. That's what we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. A lot of people quote that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It sounds really good, doesn't it? In fact, as I'd written in my notes, you hear things about the all new and it, it, you know, advertisements, that type of thing. The all new this, the all new that, and, and it's all exciting. But changing from what we have been to this new creature actually somehow can be difficult at times. Old habits die hard. The maxim goes, sow a thought, reap an action, sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. Lifelong habits that are destructive are still hard to be broken. Horace Mann, who I don't quote very often, Brother Rob, but Horace Mann said this, and it's good. Habits are like a cable. We weave a strand of it every day, and soon it cannot be broken. And the reality is, and, and I just mentioned uh, that part of this involves building a character, who we are, the way we react. You know, people will sometimes say, I know what this man's going to do. Why? Because they know his character, whether it be good or it be bad. We build a character. And we build habits. And habits are, and I'm going to say something here, and listen to me carefully. Habits of sin are impossible to break. Except that God does something miraculous within us. Character doesn't really change unless the miraculous happens through God. Now, I know that there are people who have been alcoholics who change. And, and maybe people do kick some habits. Honestly, though, in my own experience, I have seen people with very strong willpower stop smoking, drinking, for a time. But it always seems to come back. But God can make the difference. What I want to talk about, though, first, is the reasons that we should change. Because if things, if old habits are so hard to change, why should we bother? But we're not talking about getting rid of old habits. Really, we're talking about the fact that God wants to make me a new creature. Verse 15 in, in this chapter that we read says, "...and that He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again." Listen, we're not just talking about turning over a new leaf 
and kicking some old habits. That's not what's at the core of this. What really matters is that we're completely changed inside. This, this is really what it's about. This is what I mean. Whereas we served ourselves and every decision that we made, everything that we did, didn't, went through the channel of serving self. Now that's changed. The, the new creature says, here's a decision. How does Jesus see this situation? What does God's Word, how does it shed light on what I should be doing here? How does living righteously translate into what I need to be doing when this question comes up? We're no longer living for self. We're no longer living in sin. What is sin? It's a willful violation of the known will or law of God. And this is what I'm saying. How do we know the will and law of God? Because now that I'm living a new life, because I've given my heart and my life by faith into Jesus' hands, into God's hands, Doing it your way now. I'm going to read his word. It's interesting to me how people can talk about how they pray and expect God to help them and never actually pick up the Bible and say, what does the Bible have to say about my life and what's going on right here right now? So we can know what the will and law of God are by reading the Bible. But also, you know, there were people that we read about in the Bible who lived before there was any written Scripture. And yet God said things like, this man will find grace in the eyes of God. This man is righteous because of his faith. And all along, God's purpose was for people to have a... This is what God wants. I'm going to put it in a nutshell for you, I think. He wants us to be in a relationship with Him. And in so doing, He wants us to live right. So, when it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness... You can say it like this. Righteousness should translate right living. It was counted unto him for right living. He lived right because he believed God. That's what God wants. He wants his people to live right. And before it was written down in in a book, God had written it in our hearts. So people say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. He's written it in our hearts. He's given us a guide within that says, I should be treating people a certain way. So we can know how God wants us to live, how He wants us to act, what He wants us to be, but we don't always do it. In fact, on our own, we don't do it. We could say that we break God's law. Cecil B. DeMille observed of the principles contained in his movie, The Ten Commandments. It is impossible for us to break the law. We can only break ourselves against the law. It's kind of a different thought. But the law is like a rock. We don't break the law. We break ourselves against the law. When we say, I know what I'm supposed to do, but you know what? I think this will work out over here. Which is kind of what Eve did in the garden. It brings destruction. Sin is destructive. It destroys people's lives. It ultimately destroys people. 
And I explained to somebody just this week, we were talking about it. When we say sin is destructive, we're not just saying it's bad. It actually brings death. And, and one person in particular isn't that old. And, and I hear about, I mean like my kid's age, and I hear about all these problems physically. And it's hard to say it. You can't hardly tell them. But you recognize, well, that's because of this thing that you're doing in your life that's destructive. And it's bringing this thing in your life that's destructive. And it is literally killing you. Young. That's what I mean. Sin is destructive. It destroys people's lives. And as they beat themselves against the rock-solid principle that God gives for daily living, they are destroying themselves. Well, so that's the problem. But here is the thing we're talking about being made a new creature today. And there are methods of change. Now, <clears throat> people can, through God's grace, come to realize that these things that we're talking about, a violation of God's principles, do have that destructive effect on them. And, and sometimes people just say, I'm going to do better. And so they might accept religious principles or another religion, new philosophies, new paradigms, self-improvement, uh, videos, books, TED Talks. There we go, we get everybody in here. <laughs> But God wants to change us. Those are, those are external things that are trying to change the internal. But God has a completely different plan. He wants to change us on the inside. And then the change on the inside begins to come out. God makes a new creature, and the change begins in the heart. And once again, that's the center of who we are, right? But He doesn't do it without our permission or our cooperation. We have to be on His team. And so what that really means is we reject our way of doing things. It hasn't worked. I'm going to do things God's way now. We sometimes read um, the Scripture about being made a new creature in Christ and we think of somebody really bad. The gangster who's been into every vice and sin, who became a preacher. But we find that when we allow God to work in us to make us a new creature, that's me, it's not really an instant, hilarious brain transplant. But God is working on us in our personalities, in who we are. And here's the thing, we are still who we are in a sense, and yet we're giving that up. And this, this, is, this is the place where it's a little bit difficult to understand sometimes. Because sometimes Satan works in us and says, you can't change that, that's who you are, and yet God wants to change that part of what we think is us. But on the other hand, Satan will say to us, well then you're just going to be a zombie and a robot, but God still lets us, leaves us in our same personality. But He changes what needs to be changed. We don't always recognize what's been twisted and tainted by sin. But He does. And He knows what needs to change. And He knows what He created us to be. And He's changing what needs to be changed. And He's going to leave us to be what He created us to be. And to do the work where He puts us. And to be exactly how we should be. He intends to conform us to what His original plan is for us. And so He works on each of us in different ways. And um, I, I knew a couple of people. I can't see the clock with, without these. Oh, okay, I'm not as bad as... <clears throat> he works on us in different ways. And I knew a couple... I had a teacher. And, and he was... Um, basically, he'd been a pastor. He was retirement age. And, and he came to teach. And he, had, he told us how he used to be an alcoholic, and God began working on him before 
he, he knelt and was saved. He, things started changing in his life. But when he was saved, he never wanted alcohol again. I knew another man. He was my pastor who had been a smoker. And he knew that God wanted him to stop smoking. But he said, I'm trying to think, probably 20 years after he had given up smoking, he said, I still like the smell of it. What am I saying? I'm saying that God d deals with different things in different people's lives in different ways. But it's up to him, not up to us. We, we might think we know what needs to happen, especially in other people's lives. We know where they need to change, you know. <laughs> but God works in different ways in each one of us. But here's the core of the principle, and this is what Scripture says. And in the Amplified, it says it like this, old things are passed away. Previous moral and spiritual condition is what changed. What are we? What is our moral condition? We're violators of God's law. We're selfish. We do whatever it takes to please me. And there's more concern with my pleasure than with what God has to say. Our spiritual condition is that we're dead. Talked about that. We're dead in trespasses and sin. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul said. And he said, and it's in Ephesians, he said, you were dead in trespasses and sins. He's talking to people who are now changed. But he's telling them, this was your condition before. You were dead. You say, well, I'm very much alive. And, and that's not what he was talking about, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the fact that without God, and without his help, and without him at work within us, we are spiritually, that part of us that is spiritual is dead. It, ha it, it can't be alive without God. Now, somebody said to me, and I can't remember who it was, uh, said there most definitely is, now I remember, there most definitely is a, a, a spiritual part, a spiritual aspect, um, dimension to man. And he was making the point that we try to find it in different ways. But I'm saying to you that you can be cognizant of its reality and you can pursue different ways to discover the spiritual side of you but it's only through being right with your Creator that you will really and honestly be made spiritually alive. So our spiritual condition before God, we're dead, we're deceived, we're defensive about it, and we're devoted to sin and sinful habits. But these things, when Christ comes, are passed away. Because God as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God has worked. It is God's work to reconcile man to himself. I mentioned to you just a few minutes ago that we don't even understand. We're going to stand before God and we're going to realize what this passage called the terror of the Lord. Um. He's so great and so powerful, and He's far beyond our comprehension. And yet, He has worked and made Himself known. God speaks to man. Listen, He's in history. He doesn't have to do that. We're, we're, we're dust without Him. Why does God care about us? And yet, He has gone to these lengths to reconcile us to himself. And these things, old things have passed away. All things are new because of God's work to reconcile himself to us, us to himself. And yet, part of that equation is that we have agreed to enter in to the work that he does within us. be reconciled to him all things are passed away all things are new this isn't just um, 
a facelift. This isn't just turning over a new leaf. This is a complete, when, when it says all things are become new, we're talking about a complete change of the will. The most basic change is this. Where I once insisted on directing my life, I have now made God the director of my life. It's, it's not just giving lip service, but in every aspect, searching out His will, in His Word, through His people, by His divine guidance, listening to the, <coughs> the voice of conscience that He's placed within, so that we can have a true change of heart. <clears throat> a change of heart isn't, though, just, once again, this turning over a new leaf. The beautiful part of it is, is that, that the guilt that we carried for being sinful, it's gone. Our relationship is restored or made new with God. Righteousness replaces wickedness. Revival of motivation is found to please God. There's a change of heart. There's a change of mind. It's a new way of thinking. It's this idea that's found in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Would you do that on your own? If you're not thinking about God, no, you wouldn't. A new way of viewing life, a new way of loving others. It's that idea that we begin to let God put something within us so that we see other people the way that He sees them. And so when we read that Jesus looked on the people with compassion because He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. People that were lost. And we begin to see people in that same way. And it's all a result of of learning and knowing how God would have us to do things. Reconciliation brings renewal. Old things pass away. All things are become new. Um, there are concepts that are laid out, but, but it's the personal testimony that explains it best. What I mean there is, um, I've, I've just preached a lot. I've, I've said all these things about Minding God and reading His Word, and you can be made a new creature in Christ, and we should be a new, be made a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But the reality is, the thing that really makes it come alive is when somebody can stand in front of you and say, "And God did that for me." <clears throat> it's not always exactly the way we think it would be. However. That testimony explains it best. So many that we have known or who are here can testify that God has spoken and has drawn them to Himself. And God uh, has met us at an altar of prayer, wherever that altar may be, whether it be kneeling down at, at a church or in a chair or at your house or just um, driving down the road and kneeling in your heart. God, we've, we've met Him at an altar and He's done a work in us. And God draws us up and forward, changing and teaching and blessing us and teaching us to believe in Him. And when we, when we look at and we observe what He has done, we're amazed at His leading and His teaching and His renewing redemption. What, what, a, what a concept redemption is. I, I've, it's, it's kind of an emotional time maybe uh, as, as we've talked about this man who's seeing the end of his life come quickly. Uh, this, this, and I think it's okay if I talk, yeah, real quickly about James Bruno, who grew up basically without any parenting. Um, his mom was gone, his father uh, was busy, and he grew up on the streets in San Francisco. And of course, as a young, as a teen, he was introduced to drugs. And he met some people, and God saved him, and he went to Bible college, and he got married, and he was pastoring. And uh, got into drugs again. 
and, and lost everything that he was doing seemed to be destroyed. <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking about the fact that it doesn't always look like we think it should. But here he is in his early 60s, um, and it's just been over the last couple of years that, that he realized that he could come back to God in all of his mess through faith and just trust God to take care of him. And um, he's lying in a hospital bed with just not very long to live, and yet he, he believes and is looking forward to going to heaven. That's maybe a bigger story of redemption than if he were just magically changed. Redemption's an amazing thing in the way he guides us and leads us. We can be in awe at His work of reconciliation and His work of making us the righteousness of God. His work of making us a new creature in Christ. I, I so, You know, it's, it's different <clears throat> when you've grown up, and I, we have different probably kinds of people here this morning. Different for those of us who grew up in church. We don't, we don't have... I sat before... Um, I think there were about 11 guys there that day when I sat in La Plata County prison or jail in a little room, 11 guys, and they said, and I said, I don't, I don't know how to really do this, but I'm here to have a Bible study with you and we're going to begin doing it. And one of them said, well, most of the guys who come in here share their testimony with us. And so I think it was the next time I came back and I said, look, I don't have the kind of testimony where I, I was, you know, living a wild life, involved in a lot of stuff. And I said, here's my testimony. I, I grew up in church, going to a Christian school, but I was still a punk, you know, and, and I still needed to get saved. And, and so I went through it with them and told them how God had led me. And I said, that's it. And, and guy piped up and said, well, there's about 11 of us here that would do backflips to have a testimony like that. But yet at the same time, it's a little bit different for, a, for us who have grown up in that situation. We don't say, well, we, don't ha we have this radical change that everybody can see. And yet, as I said, and I think that um, everybody can identify with this, that there's something within us that God begins to deal with us and we are radically changed. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. And I hope this morning that that's your testimony. And I want us to stand together, if you will. <clears throat> and as we stand, we're going to bow our heads, close our eyes, um, and pray together. But I want to say that if that's not your testimony, that if you haven't been made a new creature in Jesus Christ, you can be. And, and so, as we pray, if you say, well, that's what I want, you're welcome to come up here and pray, and we'll pray with you, or find uh, somebody after church, pray with them, or pray in your heart right now. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you allow God to do His work, where you can be made a new creature in Jesus Christ. The old things of living for self are gone. Now I'm living for Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father... We come to you this morning and we thank you for what your word tells us about how you can work a miraculous change of redemption within us. You can redeem us from destruction. You can give us eternal life. You can cleanse our sins. And yet at the same time, you redeem our lives and you make us into something that's worthy of doing your work of reconciliation on this earth. As you, we read this morning that when we're reconciled to you, we're made ambassadors for you. Lord, you can do all of those things within us. And we pray that everyone who is here this morning has seen that change in their lives, Lord. But if there's somebody here this morning that you're talking to, help them to surrender their lives to you. Lord, we pray that as we leave this place, that you'll go with each one of us and speak to each heart. Be near to us. Bring us back together again to this place according to your will as you would see it fit to be done. It's in your name we pray it. Amen. And thank you for your kind attention. God bless you. You're dismissed.